Hello everyone, today is Thursday, April 28th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's Dave Landry's The Week in Charts is brought to you once again by Barking Squirrel Coffee Roasters, BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. Good stuff. I still like the Costa Rican, although the Ethiopian air dryer is pretty good. Also brought to you by me, of course. Somebody's got to pay for all this. Um, I need to update my graphic. I guess we're halfway, not halfway through the year, but a few months into the year, obviously. So if you want to check out my trading service, please do so. Uh, often you'll see the portfolio in these presentations. In fact, we're going to talk a little bit about it this week, and not because I want to show you it. It's just because I'm getting a few questions on it. So now would be a good time for that. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to say, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrow that line from Greg Morris. So what do we talk about today? Well, as I said a second ago, we will talk about the portfolio a little bit. But I also want to talk about seven of 17 secrets of trading. And why just seven? Well, simply there's just not enough time to, to go through all of them this week. So I'll save uh, some fodder. For next week, and I'll probably end up writing about that um, in the blog or column, whatever you want to call it. I hate that word blog for some reason. All right. Number one secret of trading is no one knows exactly where a market is headed. Not you, not me, and not the guy who screams on TV. Now, if you think about it, this is actually huge. OK, it's huge because this means that the little guy can actually compete against the big boys. And by the way, I have a lot of friends who run a lot of money. And one one of which uh, just retired was running six billion dollars. And if there was a secret I think one of these guys would have discovered it. These are these are fellow members of the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. And these are some of the brightest minds in the world. And, and I'm not sure why they let me in the club, but I'm glad they did. And I truly believe that one of these guys would have figured it out. There was some sort of holy grail or some sort of secret. So why is this perpetuated? And I think the reason is because the marketers prey on people out there who are searching for the Holy Grail, making you believe there's some sort of secret to the market. And I was at one point, I was one of those guys, too, thinking that there was some sort of secret to the market. And these marketers were using uh, taking advantage of me, so to speak. And you can't make this shit up. I recently got asked to mail. Uh, or email out to my newsletter subscribers a ad which in it said make 10 million in 10 minutes a day and I find that just um, I, I don't even know what to say about that <laughs> other than obviously I didn't mail it um, it's not that easy it's not difficult but it's not that easy hey Mark glad to see you UK checking in So, again, that's huge. The fact that there is no secret means that the average guy can compete. Number two, average intelligence is enough. In fact, I think if you are very intelligent, intelligence, showing my intelligence, if you are very intelligent, it's going to take longer logic doesn't often apply when you make a trade as Tom McClellan says you're forming a relationship between you and the company if you're trading a stock obviously and what people fail to realize at least somebody newer to trading is that you're also forming a relationship between anyone else who's ever bought that company prior to you and Tom goes on to say and those people will screw you and as I often quote my friend uh, Dick Fruth, or talk about my friend Dick Fruth over in Houston, 
he's running a few hundred million over there. And he says that um, back when he was getting into the business, way back when the earth was still cooling, I guess I shouldn't say that, shouldn't pick on, pick on too much, but he's a little bit older guy, uh, a little older than me, but not much. And he actually was a broker where people would actually hold on to their shares and bring their shares in to sell. And the other brokers would just snatch them out of their hands and do, you know, give them their ticket or whatever. Where and Dick, if you know Dick, he's a very uh, gregarious kind of guy, nice guy. He'd sit him down, get him a cup of coffee, and he's like, "Hey, why are you selling?" And he's like, well, "I'm buying a house, getting married, getting divorced." Yeah, there was there was many many reasons, but it was never because the casting oscillated across from eighty down to seventy five. And I don't know exactly if 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 ever were there any fundamental reasons they sold, but more often than not it had some kind of reason to do with their personal life and nothing to do with the trade. So you have to realize that there's no holy grail out there and logic often doesn't apply. So if you're very smart, it might take a little bit longer. What is, is, unless, of course, you're Bill Clinton. And that's how I got the name Trend Following Moron is I gave up trying to outsmart the markets in the mid to late 90s. And when I first started uh, writing columns on the Internet, back then they weren't even called a blog, I started putting these big blue hours on the screen. They're blue simply because my paint program defaulted to blue. And, and it could have easily been any other color, but it just happened to be blue. And so I draw these big blue arrows on the chart and – few times people told me where to stick them, and these people were obviously shard. And then one guy called me a trend following moron. Well, I have a pretty good idea who he is. And at that time, he had an incredibly huge short position on in a particular instrument, which I was bullish on. And I kept drawing the arrows on the chart. The reason I don't know for sure is that he's, this an email was anonymous, and then I called him on it, and then – Never heard from him again, but that's another, that's a two drink minimum story. So that's how I got the name trend following moron. And I've kind of grown to embrace that. Initially, I was really bummed out. I was depressed, uh, especially since I knew where it was coming from. But in time, I began to embrace it. And anytime I found myself trying to outsmart the market or outthink the market or micromanage or whatever, it just reminded me to follow along. And it's kind of interesting. One thing that, that has come out of the AAPTA is just is just not, not some sort of complex algorithm or something. Not that, that some of the guys in there don't do more complex things. But some of the simple things that have come out of it, such as Greg Morris talking about that trend following has the word follow in it and follow is the key word. You're, you're following the trend. You're not predicting the trend. So when you give up this, this Holy grail hunt and you just start following along, your life becomes a lot easier. And that's how I got the name trend following more. And that's why I have grown to embrace it. I haven't seen much correlation between good trading and intelligence. Many outstanding intelligent people, are horrible traders. Average intelligence is enough. Beyond that, emotional makeup is more important. Obviously, that's William Eckert. I think he was uh, one of the market wizards. So number three, continuing on that theme, attitude is more important than aptitude. A market will do whatever it wants, regardless of what you think it should do or how you feel about it. And that's pretty important, too. And, and um, as I often say, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, which is a Mike Tyson quote. And if you're not a participant of the market and you just don't care, then so what if stocks go up and down or any other market that you might that uh, is out there? I guess you just don't care. But once you become an active participant, it becomes more difficult, and then trading psychology begins to rear its ugly head. And I think Livermore said it the best. He said, a 
the speculator sometimes mistake that. Let me let me start that over. I think Livermore said it the best. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. I actually did an article just on that, and it was published in Traders Magazine a while back. And I've seen that. I'm not going to retell the story this week because I tell it almost every week. But I've seen that over and over where I just ask clients, what what are you doing wrong? And they're like, well, I'm not honoring my stops. All right, honor your stops. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing wrong? Well, I'm cutting my profit short. Well, stop cutting your profit short. It's kind of like doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Well, stop doing that. Okay? I know, easier said than done, right? All right, number four. A market can only do three things. A market can go up. A market can go down. And here's one that people often forget. A market sometimes just goes sideways. Now, before you roll your eyes at me for pointing out this Captain obvious moment, you'd be surprised how many people fight trends. And the same people who are saying, duh, right now, are going to be the same people, or some of the same people, I should say, that might email me three months from now, holding on to a stock that just keeps going lower. And not honoring their stops. So, Never forget that markets go up, markets go down, and markets go sideways. By the way, while we're on this Captain Obvious theme, in order to profit from a trade, let's say you buy here, you must sell higher than you buy. If you short a market, you must cover lower than you short it, okay? Now, the point I'm trying to make here is it notice what I notice I drew a little arrow in there. Okay, these are two profitable trades. This is a buy and this is a sell. Okay? You must sell higher than you buy and buy to cover lower than you short. So from A to B is a trend. So the point I'm trying to make is, and maybe we could have Captain Obvious say it for us, the only way to profit from a trade is to what? Is to capture... a trend okay so my feeling is why not be a trend follower all the time by the way if someone offers you an income producing strategy that tells you that you can consistently make money in the market or something that has an unbelievably high accuracy rate, 90% accurate. You need to run, not walk away from that, okay? There's a great Livermore quote. I wish I could think of it on the fly here. I didn't think I'd go off on this tangent, but imagine that, me going off on a tangent. But there's a great Livermore quote where he says something about the, um, the chap who expects the regular paycheck uh, from a market. And markets just don't work like that, okay? And we'll get into that in a few minutes. But as far as these income-producing strategies, they're very dangerous. The way you make a system give you consistent income is that you take little bitty, bitty gains, but be willing to take huge losses. And that'll work until it don't. And one thing that I'm writing about, and you know, I think I've probably written about it before because it sure seems familiar to me, but 
hopefully I'm not being redundant in this next uh, column that I put out or whenever I do publish it. But the thing is that I sound like Nicholas Fine now. <laughs> that I probably shouldn't, shouldn't preach against these systems because I get a lot of my clients from these type of systems. I get a lot of people from mean reversion type of trading. Okay. Mean reversion, you're, you're, sh you're shorting the market as it goes higher and you're buying it as it goes lower. You're waiting for that market to snap back in one direction or the other. But I get a lot of clients, probably from all of the methodologies combined, from the mean reversion or the so-called income-producing strategies. And the problem with that is if you're taking little bit of gains at big losses, the old commodity adage, eat like a bird, defecate like an elephant, you're going to do really well for a while, and you're going to feel pretty good, and then you're going to blow up. And that's just not a whole lot of fun. All right, number five. News is noise. No matter how many times I preach, I ignore all news. Read my lips. I ignore all news. People start to ask me, well, Dave, what about this? Well, Dave, what about that? Well, this is not to say that markets aren't moved by news. The point is, you cannot use news to predict a market. In fact, if you are to use news in your trading, and I suggest you don't, but you can almost fade the news as opposed to trade the news. A few years back, and it was about, a, I guess it was about a month before uh, Mr. Jobs died, Steve Jobs, and I was speaking in Dallas at, um, oh, geez, I forget the, the, uh, I could see, I could actually see their logo. Oh, it's a technical and analyst group over there. Um, anyway, I forget uh, Dallas Technical Analysis Group. Oh, geez, I'm embarrassed that I forgot that. I hope they still invite me back. Anyway, uh, I was speaking to the group, and somebody raised their head. It says, "Well, what's going to happen to Apple when when Steve Jobs die? It dies, and unfortunately, it was it was kind of a fait accompli." Uh, he was going to die. It was pretty obvious at the time. Stage three or whatever, cancer or whatever he had. And I said, well, see what the stock price is the day he dies. And if the stock begins to drop, buy the stock when it rises above that price. And the stock played out very nicely. It took off from there. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you... You trade the news, but the point I'm trying to make here is quite often the, the market will have the opposite reaction because it's already baked into the cake. Everyone knew that, barring a, a miracle, Steve Jobs was not going to make it. Unfortunately, we lost a great one, but they knew we weren't going to make it. So that news has already been factored into the market, and that's why the stock actually went up after the news was – out but I would encourage you to avoid the news and and if you decide to use the news just use it in your favor in the direction of the trend and actually you want to fade the news okay Phil says people who look for easy money invariably pay the privilege of proving conclusively that it cannot be found on this earth People who look for easy money invariably pay the privilege for, for proving conclusively it could not be found in this earth. So he's making his point twice. Good point there, Phil. MTA. Uh, AAPTA is a split off of the MTA uh, a few years back. It, that happened before I was uh, part of the AAPTA. I didn't even know the AAPTA existed until I met uh, Greg Morris in Italy on a bus. And um, they were part of the MTA at one point, and they split off. And that's kind of like – that's a long – that was before I was around. Okay, that was Livermore that said that. Oh, good quote. Thank you. Appreciate you digging that out. Couldn't find an exact quote, but this one is close. Okay, close enough. Close enough for government work. 
So again, news is noise. Um, speaking of Greg Morris, he uh, one of the first uh, presentations that I saw him give. He puts up a chart, and I think it was AOL. And he talks about the fact that there were 15 earning periods in the chart. He says, can you pick them out? And if you could pick them out, can you tell me if they were good earnings or bad earnings? There were two golf wars. There was 9-11. There was all kinds of other stuff, Asian crisis. And it's virtually or nearly impossible to pick out those news events. So be really careful with news, and your life will get a lot easier if you just uh, ignore it. I think I went about 10 years without TV in my office. I have one now. Sometimes I use it as an extra monitor. It's 60-something inches or 60 inches. So it's kind of fun to put stuff up on it. Um, I used to have it just automatically going through a lot of charts, but I just uh, got busy with some other stuff and, and had that quit. But the point is I don't watch – the markets or watch the market news anymore. Six, every methodology has its nuances. I have every italicized because, again, there is no holy grail. There is no perfect system. I've searched for a long time, trust me, and we'll probably get into this a little bit next week, but I, I, I spent years – of waking up very early in programming systems. I still wake up very early, but I don't wake up and start programming. I wake up and start working on projects or doing some research or something like that versus programming trading systems. And I learned a lot from the programming of trading systems, so I can't say that that was not time well spent. And it's sort of like everything in your life sort of makes you who you are, and that sort of made me who I am. It actually kind of maybe the opposite of, of, of the mechanical trader, which is fine. But every methodology is going to have its nuances. If you do trade one of those so-called income-producing systems, I don't want to beat the dead horse too much on that, but what's going to happen is you're going to be very accurate. You can make a lot of money. A little bit at a time, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Then you can lose it all. Then you make a little, 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 lose it all. Those are so-called anhill type of strategies. So every methodology is going to have its nuances. You're going to have to learn them and, more importantly, embrace them. Mark says, what about near earn earnings announcement? I ignore all news. But, yes, every now and then you will get whacked on an earnings announcement. So with my stuff, sometimes you are going to print money. Sometimes you're going to lose money. I can make a lot more money in my educational business if I just told you, oh, yeah, you just always make money. And then sometimes you just kind of grind it out. Phil, I don't know if you have Market Wizards opened over there, but uh, I forget his name, and, and I'm bad about doing this. I just didn't have time to, do, to finish the um, research before I got started, but uh, – there was a trader in the first Market Wizards that said three months out of the year, you're hot. You're so hot, you can't sleep at night. Three months out of the year, you're cold. You're so cold, you can't sleep at night. And then the other six months, you kind of grind it out. Well, that's not exactly how the swing to intermediate term trend following is, but it, it can be a lot like that. You get hot, and you're hot as a firecracker, and then you get cold, you can't get inside of the barn, and then the rest of the time, you just got to grind it out. I see. I have seen problems happen with all three of these things. I've seen people print money and then give up their business or career after just trading for a few months because they're making so much money trading. They think this is a permanent income hypothesis. They, the it rears its ugly head. They think they will always make this money, much money trading. And that's just simply not the case. Again, I'd make a lot more money if I just focused mostly on how much money you can make trading and not the fact that you could lose money. The problem that I see, if someone starts following along with me and we do get to a print money phase, then what do they do? They start taking setup after setup after setup and getting a little sloppy, getting a little careless 
they start entering early to beat the system. They start leveraging up. And all of that is a recipe for disaster when the inevitable drawdown does come. And we're going to talk a little bit more about drawdowns in just one minute. And then there's times when you lose money. And that's another Captain Obvious statement. But you cannot become distraught when you begin losing money trading. It's all part of the process. It sucks, okay? Make no bones about it. Uh, it's kind of example. It's kind of like uh, the I want to use the I, I feel inclined to use the, the Mike Moody example. Mike Moody was giving a speech and he was talking about relative strength, and and I'm a huge fan of relative strength, and and I've done a lot of research there, and a lot of the stocks you'll see be trade or stocks that that either have developing relative strength or once I'm in them, obviously if they're working, the relative strength is very high. But one thing I asked him, I was like, Mike, you know, one thing I found about momentum is that it ends badly. I said, what are you, what, what's your solution for that? And he just kind of smiled and said, well, if you're going to have a baby, it's kind of nice having a baby. You know, you got a little baby, but you're going to have a lot of baby poop. And baby poop comes with the territory. So that's one of the problems of trend following is eventually it's going to end badly. And then there's a lot of times where you just kind of have to grind it out. And the problem that most people have, somewhere in between the time they lose money and the time they grind it out, they give up on trend following. Well, trends, you can go all the way back to, I guess, rice in the uh, 1000s and uh, back in the Chinese, when they're like a Japanese, it was Japanese rice bull market. Bubble, I guess, South Sea bubble, uh, tulip mania bubble. That was what, the 1600s? I'm not that old. Uh, so all these bubbles existed over the years. All these trends have existed over the years. The commodity bull markets, which have helped a lot of these, uh, made a lot of these trend followers famous. So trends do exist, and trends will continue to exist. And I'm a huge fan, obviously, of trend following, especially because it's the only way you can actually make money in a market. But the problem that most people have is when they begin to lose money or get to the grinded out phase, they go off to chase rainbow. They, rainbows. They think that trend following no longer works. And guess what? As soon as they quit, what happens? The market begins to trend again. Now, one thing that I was going to say next week or tomorrow, whenever I write the column, is that you must be present to win. And that's the problem is that people give up usually right at the worst time. And it's tough. I know that. So it does take a little time and experience to get confident enough to know that, to know when you have a viable methodology and know when that just things aren't conducive for your system and you might just need to sit on your hands. Now, Speaking of sitting on your hands, this brings us to point number seven, and that is trading done properly can often be quite boring. A lot of times I don't recommend any stocks in my stock service because there's nothing to do. And as I've said this, told the story a thousand times, way, way back in the trading market day when, days when they asked me to do a service, and I agreed. And I started, that's by accident, I started a stock service back in, I don't know, 2000 maybe, 2001. And I remember we hit a summer period or something and got really choppy, and I stopped recommending stocks. And... The salesman called me up. Dave, you got to start recommending something. We're losing clients. But what's ironic is when I was recommending crappy stocks, not intentionally, of course, but when I had a losing streak, we really didn't lose that many clients. But whenever I stopped recommending uh, stocks and said, hey, let's just sit on our hands, my phone would ring. Salesman would start calling me. Dave, you got to put something on service. I'm like, no, no, I don't. Take the high road. 
is, is the way I see it. If I'm not going to do anything, then you shouldn't be doing anything. But people obviously crave action. So if you want action, I would suggest you go to Vegas. Yeah, you know, the other thing I often say is uh, you can also have an affair, and then that way you only lose half of your money. Now, obviously, I'm joking about that. But that's something that takes you a long time to realize, not that you could lose half your money in a fair. I think most people know that. But that trading done properly could be quite boring. And the longer you're in this industry, you'll find the fewer trades that you make. It's a little perverse. It's just the opposite of what you think it would be. So for me to take a trade, it's going to have to be a really good-looking setup. And if it doesn't knock my socks off, I'm willing to pass. And, and it's psychologically, you have to reach a point where can you walk away and be okay? And if you see a setup that's somewhat mediocre, it looks okay, but you can kind of pick it apart a little bit, then walk away. If it takes off, so what? Okay. But if it looks fantastic and you feel like, Jesus, this thing takes off without me, it's going to kill me because everything is there then by all means, take the trade. All right, any questions on any of that before we get into uh, questions on the portfolio? I'm helping a woman get her half in a divorce now. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Your half? I lose a lot of clients thanks to divorce. Come on, you guys, and some of you girls, too. <laughs> Craig says, Coral, sorry, he didn't get his email. Like Craig Watson, that's the uh, entrepreneur of the aforementioned coffee company. Craig's a good guy and a client. All right, I got a few questions on the open portfolio. And um, I'm always happy to talk about it when it's in the black. The first question I got was, Dave, you, keep, you always show a constant 100K but wouldn't you add in the profits? And, and that is correct, okay? Now, let's just assume that we start at 100K and, and we decide today we're going to start compounding the portfolio, and this is just an open portfolio uh, starting, let's just say, in, in February, whenever the first trade in this portfolio was initiated. So we have $9,995 open profits as of yesterday's close. So coming into today to make a trade, we would take 2% of that total sum, which includes the closed trades, which I'll talk about in a second, plus the open profits. So whatever your account value is, we're going to go ahead and risk 2% of that. So instead of risking $2,000, which is 2% of the 100K, you would actually be risking $2,199. So let's just say $2,200 round numbers. Okay. So you're actually risking, I guess you could look at it as 10% more because you're up 10% more if you want to look at it like that. And as long as things continue going fairly well, your account's going to grow faster and faster and faster. It's going to compound. Now, the reason I don't do this type of compounding in the in the quote unquote model open hypothetical portfolio is I want to keep it simple for everyone so it's there's no confusion. So if somebody comes in tomorrow, there's gonna be a hundred K here and then your two percent based on a hundred K would go into the position. In reality though, if you were growing an account and you did start with a hundred K, then you would be risking still two percent, but amount of money would be a little bit more. Now, somebody asked an interesting question. So you're growing this portfolio, and now if you looked at the original one, it would be like 2.1% if you thought about it back on 100K. And they said, wouldn't you be risking the most when your drawdown hits? And the answer is yes, because... Your account has grown in size, 
and then you hit the inevitable drawdown. And it comes back to the baby poop thing. You know, you're going to lose a little money. Every trade is going to end badly. You're either going to give up some open profits in the end, or you're just going to have a flat-out losing trade. One of those two things is going to happen, okay? So knowing that going in is, is sort of a sort of a release. It's great. It's wonderful. Not wonderful, but you're like, okay, well, I can live with this because I know it's going to happen. So, yes, you will be risking the most amount of money, not percentage-wise, but just the most amount of money when the drawdown hits. The good news is when the drawdown begins to hit, then there's a very good chance that something has changed in the markets. And if you don't recognize it immediately, your portfolio will tell you. Okay, you start getting stopped out of stocks. We were heavily short earlier this year. And what happened? The market started going up. Well, we got stopped out of those stocks. Most of them were for nearly all of them, I think, were for a profit. There was one that had a bad entry on that was a loss. But I think other than that, they all worked. Not that I'm always that accurate. I wish I was. You'd never see my fat ass again. But what happened was conditions were changing. So when you hit that drawdown, and you're heavily short, you will have to give up some of those open profits. But the reason that you're giving up those open profits is because the trend may have changed. So two things. One, you're going to see fewer short setting up. And if you're waiting for an entry, maybe you won't get triggered on the ones that do set up. And if the market keeps going up, you'll see fewer and fewer setups. Okay. And if the market starts going sideways, it gets choppy, then you might just have to sit on your hands. So, yeah, you're going to get take that initial hit. And, again, it's the baby poop thing, okay? So let's say you your, your equity curve looks something like this, and you really start printing money. All of a sudden, you hit the drawdown. Well, initially, it's going to look like that. Oops. Initially, it's going to look like this. And then it's going to flatten out a little bit because you'll stop trading because there will be fewer and fewer tradings. And then you might end up in the grind it out where it kind of looks like this, where it just kind of looks like a bit of a heartbeat for a while until you get on one side of the trend or the other, okay? So, yeah, you're going to be risking the most at least dollar-wise, not percentage-wise, but dollar-wise when the drawdown hits, okay? And you will get whacked at least initially when the drawdown hits, but it's just the baby poop thing. It comes to the territory. Like – who was a dentist said he treated the way he felt about open losses to profits was a lot differently than he felt about open losses. Okay. Read. Um, it's an entertaining book. It's a Curtis Facebook, the way of the turtle. One of those turtle books. I swore I was not going to read any of those turtle books until Larry McMillan's like, Oh yeah, it's a pretty good book. They talked about having a, they had a ping pong table in the office, which was kind of cool. And they actually became semi-professional ping pong players, which is pretty cool. I know I'll tell a story every week, but it's kind of cool. But anyway, yeah, there will be some open losses to profits, and that comes with the territory. And the ebb and flow of the portfolio is very important. Notice that these are all ones. Okay, go back, and you can get on delayed service and check this out. It's, it's, there's nothing to hide. Uh, it's all out there for free. You can go out and look at the delayed service, and you'll go earlier this year, and they were mostly negative ones, or all negative ones, meaning shorts. And the reason I have negative one for short is just to make the math so I don't have to change the formulas in here. So if I put minus one, and this number is smaller than this number, then it's profitable. Okay? And then the formula in here somewhere, right here, calculates that for me. And if you want the spreadsheet, let me know. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the current snapshot, and that way you could uh, – or a recent snapshot at least. So you could you could punch in your own stocks on here. So the point about the ebb and flow is we let the shorts get stopped out. Why'd you let that happen? Why'd you let that happen? Why you just didn't get out? Well, because we followed a plan. We didn't know that this downtrend was not going to continue. The market has taken its own sweet time in rolling over. Maybe it will roll over later this year. Okay, Maybe that's beginning now. We'll take a look at that in just one minute. 
But we let the shorts get stopped down. And what happened? Well, somewhere around February, we started buying what? Metals and mining and energy stocks because that's what was set up. So let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. And yes, you will be trading biggest dollar-wise when the drawdown hits. But so what? It comes to the territory. Let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. And if there's nothing to do, don't do anything. Okay. Isaac said it's a very good book. Yeah, it was very uh it was very entertaining. It's not that I learned a lot from it, but from a philosophical standpoint, there's a lot of good stuff in there. It really is. How many of your clients do you believe follow your methodology discipline to the letter? I don't know for a fact, but it probably would be in the low single digits <laughs> because people quit doing great times. I'm like, my little Cajun just slipped out. People quit doing great times because we'll be doing great. And... I'll get a phone call. Dave, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going to quit. Why are you going to quit? We're doing great. Well, I'm losing money. Well, how can you be losing money? It's like, well, I don't know. I took ABC and I lost money. It's like XYZ and I lost money. I'm like, what about these other two? Oh, I didn't take those. It's like, well, <laughs> and that's part of next week's um, conversation is that those outliers – that might be the mother of all trends. And you grinded it out, grinded it out, but you didn't bother taking those two or three trades that would have made your whole year. So how many people actually follow it? Probably not many. Phil's often saying, hey, uh, I, I, your people are in here in the market. And I tend to disagree with him. I think every now and then he might be on to something. But for the most part, would you see an entry of mine trigger – it's like crickets on a time in sales. And the reason is people either, A, as I, I like to use Greg's term, they sharpshoot the signals. They decide which ones are going to take and which ones are not going to take. Or B, they try to outsmart the system. They're already in. Okay? They got in early. And that's the same story I always tell over and over again. Dave. I'm down 50% in this stock. I'm like, why'd you buy that stock? You told me to. It's like, really? <laughs> no, I didn't. It's going straight down. Yes, you did. When did when did I tell you to buy the stock? Last May. Last May. Good Lord. Let me go look. And I go look at the charts. Like, yeah, it was a beautiful little pullback last May, but it never even triggered. So what did they do? They bought it anyway. So I have no idea who's actually following along, but – I could rest assured that I could I could quadruple the amount of people I have on the service and it would not affect the performance of the service as far as the market dynamics because a very small percentage of the people would be actually following it to a T. So that's a long-winded Answer. Jill says, I'll follow you to the letter. Well, fantastic, Jill. That's awesome. And, you know, I'll tell you this. I don't want to pick uh, – oh, Phil, you too. That's good. Fantastic. I have found that – I've only had one woman email me that, that, that just really just kind of blew up in a, in a bad way because she, she went a little crazy emotional with the trading and all. And I feel bad about that. But for the most part, I find that women actually make better traders than men. Now, are women more emotional than men? Absolutely. But women don't have the ego that men have when it comes to trading. And women respect risk. And it's kind of interesting. I read it in, uh, I think it was a book by Monnier. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he says in his book. I think they're more like value oriented, but from a philosophical standpoint, some of the psychology does make a little sense. And, and it was kind of an interesting statement. The guys that got their wives involved with their trading decisions, their performance went up 
versus the guys that did not. And I often tell guys that, hey, you guys, you're having trouble. Hold yourself accountable. Now, it's probably a, put a strain on a relationship, so you might want to find someone who you're not in a, in a relationship with to do that. But when you have somebody holding you accountable, it'll help to keep that ego in check and stop you from, from making some of these mistakes. Now, the interesting point about Montier, what he went on is, to say was, and I'm not sure, he was quoting somebody else's research, but that's where I read it, a uh, be, little behavioral finance book or something. I forget the exact title of that. All my books got disorganized. I had them all in a big stack in my office, and my wife picked them up because we had Greg visiting a while back, so I've got to find them all. Uh, but anyway, if somebody knows the name of that book, you know, if you say it, I'll, 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 I'll say it now. But he went on to say that what's interesting is the women who got their husbands involved did worse. And I think that's because the ego comes into play. So, Jill, uh, good job on following along. Phil, I know you're a good trader. I'm always talking about you, so I'm proud of you too. Not that it's only my way or highway, okay? I would I would encourage you to to do your own thing in addition to following along with me. But as far as what I'm saying is don't try to don't try to beat the system by getting in early or staying in later, sharpshooting the signals and all. If you're following me, then follow me in, in the portion that you have uh, allocated to follow me. If you have your own way of doing things, then that's fine. Use my research to help you out. But as far as following along, if you're following the system, then you need to follow the system and not try to beat it. Hopefully that makes sense. Dr. Thomas Carr, show your wife your portfolio. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, Dr. Thomas, Thomas Carr. Okay. That's a long one to answer that, huh? Could you help me understand the numbers in the initial risk gold? Okay, last two weeks, or go back about three weeks, we uh, we talked about setting the initial stop, okay? So go back in and watch those two webinars and go back in and read the – go to my column archives, which I think – we could look real quick. We'll see when that was. But it was recently on setting us. Where's my content? Oh, there it is. Yeah, right here. The Art and Science. Read this article here. And then go back and, and watch this week of charts. And then go to videos and watch the week before week of charts. So last week and the week before. And that's going to uh, help you go a long ways on to, on to setting your stops. So based on that initial risk or goal, I'm sorry, based on that initial risk, that helps us to set the goal. In fact, that's the, it's one for one, okay, on the first half. So if we're risking 1.8, then what's our profit that we're looking for? 1.8. If we're risking 3.15 on the trade, what's our initial profit? 3.15. 1.8. 1.8, 2.1, made a little bit less on this one. A little something happened. I don't remember what. Uh, kind of thin on getting filled is probably what happened. But close enough. So roughly 1% on the account is what we're looking for. But Dave, one for one, does it have a negative expectancy? Well, if that's all you made was one for one, yes. But the real money is in the second loaf of this trade. So go in and watch those two videos. I did the one on expectancy. There's two videos out there on expectancy. I need to try to find them, but it's going to be like R versus R, which is risk versus reward. And I did. I spent two weeks on that in and of itself. So watch the two on stops. Then go back and, and watch the, the one on expectancy. We're playing for the outlier, and that's where the real money is. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully – these open trades in here become big winners. Now, notice that some of these are highlighted and some of them are not. I got asked that too recently, or last week, I should say. 
the ones that aren't highlighted are the ones that we've taken partial profits on already. And then this is the remainder of the position, which is highlighted. So this is the trending loaf, and this is the trading loaf. So we do scale out of the position to help to mitigate the drawdowns a little bit, to maybe make a little money when that's all the position is going to go. It just goes up a little bit in our favor. We'll get the swing trade out. We'll get scratched out in the remainder. And that kind of keeps us in the game, keeps our head above the water. And then we also keep that piece just in case it does take off. And that way it's sort of like have your cake and eat it too. Now the question becomes, well, would your position be smallest when you have the, the greatest trend? And the answer is yes, but that's okay. Two things. One, you could still swing trade around the position, which I don't actually walk you through in the actual service, although I've helped a few of you guys get started in doing that. I can't help you on every trade, but I could help you get started doing that as a couple of you guys can attest to. So you can make a little money on the swing trades in between. But the second thing is it, it's it's still a sizable enough position to make it all worthwhile. So you can see like in this particular case here as of yesterday's close, a 77% gain is still a 2.2% gain overall on your portfolio and if this stock goes on to double then that's a four point percent gain four percent gain and change four and a half and so on and so forth so that's where the real money is okay so i can't yeah sorry about um uh backing up on that for those of you who don't know it <laughs> does your wife keep you trading in check uh, don't go there girlfriend travis follows it good job travis but you're one of that clf yeah CLF, we, we'll pull up, remind me, well, I'll leave the question up there. We'll look at that in a minute. CLF was an opening gap uh, reversal. So, John, hopefully that helps. Uh, lots and lots of videos out there. In fact, I'm, I'm just, uh, as I start going through them, I was like, wow, I put a lot of content out there. So check out the, um, the videos on my website, and then the easiest way to find them is just go to videos. And I've got them somewhat organized here. And then also you want to go to... Um, to YouTube and make sure you join the YouTube channel afterwards, okay? My well, rooster decided to hang out in front of my office. <laughs> He's crowing about something. All right, Steve says, as an ex-trading service member, I could say I have tried every reasoning method possible this included doubling, guessing, second guessing, et cetera, and found the only times I was profitable was when I followed your methodology to a T. Even though I did it mechanically, I still outperform any attempts I made to modify slash change your methodology. The method works, period. Yes, it can be boring and negative at times, but over time, it's successful. Wow. Thank you, Steve. That's, uh, that's, uh, I, I, I have tears in my eyes. Thank I appreciate that. I, um, I'd love to quote you on that. So if you give me permission, uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, anyway, this I, I forgot to get it loaded into cash, but this is the video page. So if you get a chance, I did start organizing these, and I probably need to move them to a few pages. But the weekend charts are up top, and then if you scroll down, these are special market updates that I've done. Here's some how-to videos. And then, of course, join the YouTube channel, and you'll get all of this stuff right here. Oh, thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Craig says, ditto, ditto on Steve. Well, Craig, I'm going to use you too, buddy. <laughs> You've already given me a couple of testimonials, so I guess you'll, you'll allow me to use that too, right? Correct? guess I'll be advertising coffee again next week. <laughs> All right. Uh, a couple of more things in the slides, and then uh, we, we'll have plenty of time to jump out to the chart. So let me just uh, wrap that up so we can uh, get finished up. Um. I'm still rolling out the uh, website, and it's kind of a work in progress, and, and hopefully I'll reach a point where I stop messing with things, but I'm still tweaking it a little bit. Uh, I do have a fast track special going on right now, and um, it'll probably be shut down. Well, I think I have a, a deadline of May 31st if it doesn't sell out first. 
But basically, you get everything for over half, like 50%, 60% off, and then uh, two hours of my time is included with that. So check that out to get a chance. And I promise to make it worth your while. And obviously, any questions, just shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. I do answer all my emails. Um, <laughs> all right, Eric says, at layman's page 116, 118, you suggest sticking to stocks $3 to avoid penny stock problems. That was 2010. Now I see you consider your stocks less than $3. is a high volume, I think. How do we decide if the price is still a viable setup? Well, first of all, you want to look for you want to look for structure. And, and if you go back many years ago, I probably said ten dollars or twelve dollars a share. But after a couple of bear markets, and especially if you get a bear market in a sector that goes on and on and on and on and on, like the energy bear market or the metals and mining bear market, then you end up with a lot of really low priced stocks. So I, I've got to be careful, I guess, and and putting any fixed rules like that in place. But I think the $3 came from, as a general statement, anything below $3, $3, you really need to look at it very carefully to make sure that it's worth trading. So, yeah, make sure that the volume is very high so it's a very liquid stock, okay? If it's less than three dollars, and this is on U.S. exchanges, your your exchange may vary, where whatever exchange you're on. But U.S. exchanges, make sure you have very high volume because if the price is low, then you're going to need a lot more volume to make up for dollar value of the stock. Okay, so in other words, a higher price stock can have lower volume, but it's still a lot of of money changing hands. If one dollar stock has a million shares traded, that's only a million dollars. But if a hundred, if a if a hundred dollar stock has a hundred thousand shares traded, then that's a pretty big number. What would that be? One hundred uh, times one hundred. Yeah, that's what ten million. So now it's ten million dollars worth of shares traded. So make sure the volume is really high. And above all, make sure it has uh, structure, okay? So if it's bottomed out really nicely and makes a little bow tie or first thrust and it's trading really cleanly, it's accelerating higher or persisted in its trend and or persisted in its trend and just looks fantastic, then go for it. If it's all over the place, then same thing applies. And a lot of those lower price stocks can be really choppy. So uh, there's no hard and fast rule, and I, I probably need to take that out. Uh, if I ever do another uh, version of it, B but um, that's the reasoning behind it. So, yeah, you're right. You, the way you answered your question, just make sure there's plenty of volume. And then also make sure there's a um, structure, okay? Any guidance on the minimum dollar value, dollar volume? Uh, I have my tradable universe set to 250K. It's 250,000 on average, 30-day average volume. That's a good place to start. But like I said a second ago, if you're looking at a lower price stock and the volume is uh, 250K, that might not be enough. Okay, so let me just see if we have something in here we can look at. Um like the CNX, I mean, look at the average volume on this thing. It's tremendous. It's uh, it's like 90 million shares a day, okay? Uh, let me see if there's one that's a little bit lower price. The CNX, okay, it's, uh, was that 30 million shares a day? Is that correct? Or 3 million shares a day. So it's significant. It's still, it's still a pretty thick stock as far as amount of volume. So it was down here around 4 bucks a share. But it had a nice thrust from lows. It had a little pullback. It was bottoming out longer term. So it did have some structure to it. So um, I would say anything over, let's say, $5 a share that trades over half a million shares on average is probably liquid enough to trade. And then as the price goes up, you could come down a little bit on your volume. 
250,000 is a good number because you're still getting the small cap speculative issues that have potential, but it's also liquid enough to where you could still uh, still trade those stocks. And then you have to make a judgment call sometimes based on those. So hopefully that helps, Donald. If not, uh, we could uh, explore that further. Okay, Matt says, I find times when I overthink the entry and determine it won't work and usually your best or usually your best picks. Yeah, I mean, like I said, people tend to, to outthink things and, and it's scary. It's funny. It's scary on every trade. When I recommended the CNX and the CENX, I, it, I found myself getting nervous. Whenever when I recommended the AROC uh, or the NVTR, I found myself getting nervous. Like no matter what trade no matter how long I've been at this, or nearly every trade, I still get nervous. Especially because I know that I've got a lot of people counting on me and looking over my shoulder, however you want to look at that. So it stresses me out, both personally and, and the way I feel about it, worried about it publicly. I don't want to look like an idiot. Okay, I could, You call me a trend-following moron, but I don't want to look like an idiot. So, yeah, and then most people, like I said, you know what you're doing wrong, but you do it anyway. And, and with this stuff, even for – the point I'm trying to make is even for me, you're still taking a leap of faith every time you go into a new trade. And it's weird that I still have that feeling. It should be like, ah, it's just nothing here, right? But those emotions never really go away. So don't feel like – there's something wrong with you because you're like, oh, my God, is this trade going to work or not? Guess what? That feeling never really goes away. And if you reach a point where you just – where you feel like, oh, it's going to work, then, then you got bigger problems, okay? Then you're delusional, okay? Okay, I find times I overthink the entry and determine it won't work and usually your, or usually your best picks, such as I passed on CLF due to the gap. Well, that's a different story. We'll talk about that. I need to find a balance between mindlessly trading your entries and finding entries that make sense to me. Work in progress for sure, as George Seinfeld says. It's uh, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> yeah, the CLF that was um, I went I would have had the official uh, discretion on that one was let it go, but of course you know it's taken off. Now you will see this one in the actual portfolio as of tonight. And the reason is because the portfolio was followed mechanically. Now, the entry was like right here. And I warned everybody. I said, hey, guys and girls, uh, the entry is really close. So you're going to have to make a decision on the open. If it gaps open, it comes back in, then avoid it. Okay. And then if it begins to take off, you have to make a go or no go decision. Um, and that could be tough. I realize that. So in this case, you can see it kind of took off and then meandered around a little bit. Then you can make a decision whether or not you want to get in after that range is taken out. But mechanically, again, we're going to count this as a trigger because it did trigger. Okay. Uh, one thing, if it, if it ever gaps above the recent high, then it's a general statement. You probably want to go ahead and ignore it. Anything less, then it becomes a discretionary call. Okay. If it just gaps slightly above the entry and then starts going higher, then I would say you take the take the stock. You don't split hairs. Take the setup. Okay. But yeah, there's no, and that's a thing. Is like somebody asked me today. Um. How long do I give it after the open? And what price should it be? It's like, well, it's it's like you know it when you see it. You can't just say, I'll give it 10 minutes because a lot could happen in 10 minutes, okay? You just have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and exercise a little bit of discretion. Now, there's going to be some obvious times where it gaps open, it comes right back in. You totally avoid the trade. If it gaps up above the prior high, then the trade should be totally avoided. And again, anything in between, you have to make the discretionary call, okay? Now, I will say this, and I'll probably do a column on it soon. My daughter was in a stock picking contest. And, you know, with these kids, it's impossible to get any information out of them. But I know she did 
I know she did pretty well because um, she had a lot of help. <laughs> And uh, I'll have to pull up her portfolio, and I'm dying to find out how she did versus the other class. She said one kid bought a penny stock in, in, um, on margin, which the system let them do for some reason. And, uh, it, and she said they won. But I, I need to find out where she, she turned out because it, all I did with her is the same thing when I did with someone when I taught someone else how to, how to trade stocks for a stock contest is just buy new highs, okay? You can't do that in all of your trading, okay, because you might hit the market wrong. But if you were running a very large portfolio and that's all you did, then the amount of winners would probably be greater than the amount of losing trades. You certainly would do a lot better than fighting the trend. In fact, what I used to do with a, with a, a, a portfolio, I didn't actually trade, although there was some interest on the uh, institutional side and in, in, in what I was doing. They didn't pan out, but that's another, that's a two drink minimum story. But anyway, and I, I tracked it for a while. I was doing very well. The drawdowns were, were pretty abysmal though. I will tell you that, but it did incredibly, it printed money and then it, abysmal drawdowns, printed money, abysmal drawdowns, typical of, of a pure relative strength system. But all I did, the secret to that system was I bought stocks market on close when they had an expansion of range at new highs. So this would actually be a buy for that type of system, okay? Uh, and it worked out pretty well, but the drawdowns are abysmal. So that I need to work that into the column when I, when I get around writing that how to win a stock picking contest or die trying, because if you hit it wrong, you get a really bad drawdown. That's why I don't advocate that method all the time. I've kind of tweaked things to this pullback hybrid approach. Hybrid and we're doing mean reversion in the direction of the trend, so that's hybrid. Hybrid in the money management, we're scaling out of the position, and then also hybrid in that we're keeping part of the position open, okay? CLF is tricky. His earnings during setup. I bought a third of position soon after the open, but I'm still waiting for pullback to get the rest. Having said that, open profit, I will only buy, I will have, having said that, the open profit I have will buy your service for a while longer. Oh, thank you, Phil. Appreciate that. John says, you really helped me think about following the process and how important that is, especially when the first half hits the initial profit target, and I want to hesitate due to greed. So I now take the profit and pat myself on the back. Absolutely. And, and that's the bottom line is, and, and this is a speech I often give and, and often write about, and I know I beat the dead horse in a lot of this stuff, but it really is, it really is a, a process-oriented type of business. And if you follow the process, I don't know if you guys can do that rooster crow or not, sorry about that. Um, but if you follow the process, pat yourself on the back, absolutely. Win, lose, a draw, okay? If you do lose on a trade, make sure you do a postmortem. Make sure the trade looked great to begin with. And if it did, in perfect hindsight, if it still looked great to begin with, then congratulate yourself for doing it, for taking it, even though you lost money. Now, if you do something stupid and make a lot of money, like, the little girl in my daughter's class who uh, bought a bunch of penny stock on, on margin just by accident and she won, then that's stupid. That's, that's not repeatable. He just got lucky. So if you ever get lucky in the market, thank the man upstairs or thank whoever, okay? Put the money in your pocket and enjoy it, but don't let it go to your head like, it was some sort of skill. And that's something that all these behavioral finance books, they're all kind of, somebody was asking me what I'm reading this morning. And like I said, I've got a stack of those books and uh, my wife put them back in the bookshelf. So I got to dig them all out again, one by one. But they're all, they're all starting to sound the same. A lot of those behavioral finance books, uh, just that they all say the kind of the same things. But one thing that's a reoccurring theme is that as human beings, when we do something and we make money doing it, we consider that a skill, okay? 
But if we do something and we lose money doing it, we consider that being unlucky. Okay. So that could be kind of tough in the market. So you, you have to be process oriented, even if that process has you losing money on occasion, which it will. And again, I make a lot more money in my education business if I said you only made money. All right. With that out of the way, uh, you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, please do. Um, uh, one line, one per, one symbol per line, if you don't mind. Ask about as many as you want. Just hit enter after you uh, ask about one, and that way I make sure that everybody gets um, their stocks and you and all the stocks that uh, you want to ask about. Now let's take a look at the spiders first. It's kind of interesting that we did have uh, some weakness coming into today, but so far the market has recovered. Now let's pop back to the cash. One thing that I'm seeing here is that, yes, the intermediate term uptrend remains intact. And so far, so good there. Okay. So since the February lows, the market has had a pretty good run. But in markets, it's a bit of a Janet Jackson type of thing. It's like, what have you done for me lately? And lately, the market has started to go a little sideways basis of the P's. So on a closing basis, we haven't changed a whole lot in here in a little while. And if that continues, that means that volatility is beginning to drop off. Volatility tends to wax and wane because traders usually don't agree for very long when it comes to markets. And then once that volatility begins to compress, you see a larger than normal move in volatility and the volatility begins to expand again. So shorter term, little sideways, volatility compressing. We could see a pretty big move soon. What's concerning is that we have this overhead supply. And in the P's, case of the S&P 500, it's kind of like this, these multiple tops in here, too, to overcome. Anybody who bought around this range might be looking to get out at break even. I know some people who just started investing in 2015, and they were pretty nervous, nervous earlier this year. They were already thinking about bailing out. So I'd be willing to bet that now that they're back to break even, they're being forced to rethink this investing thing in the stock market at least. Uh, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent. Imagine that. But in trading, you sometimes need to, need to think about big picture scenarios just in case they happen so it doesn't become a big shocker to you. Okay. The, the real estate bubble, I remember in 2000, a doctor came up to me. I'm done with stocks because stocks were dropping like a stone. I'm going to invest only in real estate now. I'm like, okay, doc, well, be careful because bubbles can happen there too. And a few years later, bubbles happen. That's another two drinks story minimum. And boy, do I have some stories there. Uh, by the way, watch The Big Short. That was a good movie. And you, if you watch the stuff, watch The Big Short, the, a lot of the characters in the movie I knew personally, not the, not the actual guys, but the – characters in that real estate bubble type of thing. So anyway, the point is you have to think of some scenarios. And one of those scenarios would be if this thing broke out to do highs, anybody who bought since 2009 has this permanent income hypothesis that the market only goes up. So 2009, I mean, what a run that has been. But now if we break out to new highs, they're going to all feel pretty good about everything. The Johnny come latelys are going to be forced in. And you can actually see a, you can actually see a blow off type of move. Now, I don't want to think too far into all these different scenarios, but we could see a blow off move to new highs. And that would not necessarily be the all clear. But Dave, you're a trend follower. Wouldn't you be following? Absolutely. OK, we're we're 100 percent long now as far as number of, of longs versus shorts in the portfolio. I'm just very cautious about this market. Even if it broke out, I would still be cautious. But, yeah, I'd be following along like a good little trend-following moron. The point is that anybody who bought since 2009 will breathe a sigh of relief and think that everything's okay and that the market only goes up. After you've been doing this for a while, you'll live through a few of these cycles and you'll see it reoccur, okay? At the end of 2008, early 2009, nobody ever bought it, wanted to buy stocks again. Now or at least last few years, everybody feels like, oh, the market just goes up and it, can, and it can't go down, okay? 
Yeah, I'll get there, Craig. Good point. Uh, Craig was talking about the dollar. Perfect. Glad you brought it up. All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ uh, it's kind of been drifted lower as of late. Same sort of short-term sideways action. Let's clean up the chart a little bit. It's getting a little bumpy in here, though. The S&P, the volatility is compressed. NASDAQ uh, is just getting a little bit more bumpy. Never forget about net-net change, okay? Um, if you in telechart, you put put uh, hit the C key, and that tells you um, you could drag it wherever you want. But you can see right here, we're pretty much flat in the NASDAQ for om almost a month. And that's pretty impressive uh, for a market to be relatively unchanged for a month. Uh, yeah, if you go back to here, it's still in an uptrend, but to here, it's sideways. And then what's scary, again, in the NASDAQ, like the other indices, you have a lot of overhead supply to overcome. Uh, Russell looks even worse as far as the overhead supply. Now, one thing that, that's been kind of, um, I don't want to say baffling me, but I find interesting is the Russell's kind of been defying gravity a little bit and kind of working its way higher. Uh, but one thing that's a little concerning here is you can see it's kind of drifting higher and not going straight up. Uh, in uptrends, you want to see a market pull back versus like this versus drift higher because drifting higher, it's just kind of like the last of the buying comes in. Whereas when you have a correction, this shakes out a few people and could set it up for the new leg higher. So that's one thing that's a little concerning here. But I don't want to get too wrapped up in the micro. Let's take a look at the macro. Look at a weekly chart here. And we're pushing into all this overhead supply. Now, the market can do whatever it wants. It might plow right through and keep on going. I hope it does. But just know that this is not a uh, – not that it's ever safe. But this is not a uh, – this is a dangerous time to just be buying stocks in general. You have to pick your spots very carefully. All right. Uh, let's take a look at the dollar while we're on here. And then a couple more sectors, and I promise we'll get to those uh, stocks. The dollar is in a downtrend, okay? A bit of a Captain Obvious statement here, but for those of you who don't know how to draw your arrows just yet, it's obviously in a downtrend. Let's back the chart out a little bit. And you can see that it's pretty much rolling over. It looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Let's take a look at a weekly chart and take a look at some bow ties there. Uh, notice that we just got our bow tie sell recently here. And this is coming off of fairly major highs. Let's back the chart out a little bit. It's multi-year highs. In fact, as high as it's been since 2009. So this is a serious sell signal. You want to be short the dollar right now, okay, as a general statement. The great thing about that dollar down is somebody's asking about XME. XME, great. Uh, you set me up here. Perfect. What is XME? It's the Metals and Mining ETF. And what is it doing? It's going up. Well, dollar down, commodities up. You got a bow tie somewhere back here in this thing. Let's see if we've got a weekly bow tie yet. Yeah, you're getting a weekly bow tie coming in this XME. And it's starting to look pretty good. Okay. Remember the weekly bow tie down and all the energies and everything and, and metals and mining and everything else, all those commodities back in 2007. And obviously, it's, it had a pretty serious slide since. So, yeah, XME looks like it's on its way up. But if you're not already long, wait for the next pullback. Now, if you're trying to be – if you're playing – if you're in a stock contest and it's not real money, then, yeah, buy it today at any price and just leave it in your portfolio because, one, it's in an uptrend. Two, it's making new highs on somewhat of an expansion of range like we just talked about a few minutes ago. Um. Real estate losing some steam in here, and that might be uh, pressured a little bit by those rising interest rates. Uh, notice that utilities are beginning to roll over in here. And again, that might be pressured by rising uh, interest rates. Take a look at TLT. That's the bond. So it's been, as a general statement, it's kind of been rolling over and dropping as of late, as you can see. And let's take a look at a longer chart. That's a weekly. Um it's not the end of the world here, but it has been weak as of late. So this is a little bit concerning because that means rates could be headed higher. And obviously, as the bond goes down, rates go up. One thing that's kind of has me concerned is some of these areas, such as defensive areas like the foods, are losing a little bit of steam in here. So that's kind of interesting. That's kind of like the only game in town not long ago. What else is going on? Defense. Stocks are breaking out. The only problem with defense stocks is not defensive stocks is they are 
they, t they tend to be very high cap stocks. Also, it's just getting past its prior peak in here. And this is a potential double top problem. So I'd much rather be buying something like the energies and metals and mining, which are just coming off of major lows, as opposed to these stocks up here at high levels with these V-shaped type recoveries. I talked a lot about that lately, so I don't want to get into too much detail. Uh, let's hop into individual, keep up the uh, stocks. Uh, Andre wants to know about X. X is going to be U.S. Steel, which is obviously a metal and mining company. Um, yeah, I mean, it pulled back in here. It's kind of taken off. The only thing that I don't like is it sort of, it kind of lost a little momentum and then kind of took off and then came back into its prior little base. So I would pass based on that. By the way, this was in my daughter's portfolio because it was it was making new highs on expansion of range. So we bought it. By we, I mean me. <laughs> She had to make a bug years ago, and I tried to get involved in the process, and I made this beautiful, huge uh, bug, as big as it could be within the parameters or whatever. It was just beautiful. It was a um, caterpillar. What do you call those things? Those, those wasps. It was beautiful. And she came home, and uh, <laughs> she gave it to me. She goes, you got an A on your bug. <laughs> I guess I got an A on a stock course. I did force her to sit down with me so she understood what was going on. I guess I don't want to get in trouble too much. Uh, FXY, that's a Japanese yen. Yeah, it's uh, obviously headed higher in here. Um, it will have some uh, resistance to overcome, but so far so good as far as uh, headed higher. It's not set up right now, though. Andre wants to know about BRSS. Uh, yeah, it's banging out new highs, a little bit on the thin side. But as a private trader, I hear you could trade it um, on a pullback. Yeah, it might be worthwhile. Some people ran yesterday CLF momentum, very bad people. Some bad people ran, front ran CLF's momentum, very bad people. That's possible, okay? <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that, but uh, that's possible. And that does happen. I see it quite often in the service. Um, if you have an entry here, people will front run the setups. It's fine when you're in a good market. And right now, we're in a good market for energies and metals and mining because they're going up. You just can't get in a habit of front-running setups all the time. By front-running a setup, that means, let's say, your entry is at 10 and it's at 990. You get in just a little bit early, okay? Nothing wrong with doing that, okay, if conditions are really good. So I hear you, Phil. Maybe some, some people front-ran the uh, setup. That's fine. Winning is lucky. Not losing money takes skill. All right. Uh, I can't. Is that a Toronto stock? I can't pull up Toronto stocks on this uh, on this computer on this chart. T W T R as a chart. That's Twitter. T W T R. Well. It's already broke. Yeah, no, no, it's too low. It's already not, not that a market is ever too low to short, but I would much prefer a market that's just beginning to roll over. Uh, utilities aren't a great example because utilities are kind of um, kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Low in volatility. But if I were to short a market, I'd prefer it would look like this, just beginning to roll over. As opposed to something that's already at down at low level, so I would I would avoid Twitter as a short. Uh, but obviously it's headed lower. Sky. The problem with this is it took off and it came all the way back in. Also super thin, so that's too thin to be trading. Uh, but it's just too dangerous. It's just I don't like the way it went all the way up. It came right back in. So it did a 180 as far as the um, what, what what am I trying to say? It's kind of that. It, it, it returned back to its base, so it's no longer worthy as a setup. Nice webinar. CYNO for Steve. CYNO. We've got a few Steves in here today. Welcome, Steves. Um, yeah, maybe on a pullback. Let's, uh, let's see what happens when it pulls back. The only problem is if it begins to pull back, then it's going to be too close to this base. So the base breakout wasn't quite enough in this one. So I would I would pass on that one. 
R Y A M for Angelo R Y A M. I'm not really crazy about this big wide range bar back here, but that was a while ago. Let's not get too excited about that. Let's see what else is happening. Um, it has a bit of a knockout move, which looks okay, but it sort of pulled back to this prior base in here. I'm going to give it an okay. It's a little wide and loose longer term. Chemical stocks sometimes can be kind of choppy. Uh, I think I would pass and, and look for something else. If this if this run here were a little bit better and higher before this knockout move, I think I'd be a little bit more excited about it. NUGT for Andre, NUGT. That's going to be a metal to mining stock. Um, initially, uh, first thing I would say is it's triple leveraged. So be damn careful whenever you're trading these triple leverage things. Unless you're day trading, which I would recommend you not do, then don't trade them, okay? Um, if you're position trading, then you actually have to take the leverage out for your position sizing. So in other words, you would trade one third as much as a triple leverage stock as you would the unleveraged counterpart because the volatility is three times as much because of the leverage. The, the tracking error is abysmal on these things. So I would encourage you not to trade anything triple leveraged. But yeah, it's obviously headed higher because gold is headed higher. Oh, USO before I forget, this is uh, energy. Um, you guys went by went if you watched me from last year, we were going after energies back here. What happened? That eh, didn't work. Well, so what? We were right, but early. That's the same thing, Michael. Well, yeah. So we were wrong, but now they're making new highs, and we didn't get a setup in the actual commodity that we decided to take. At least when we took, we just traded the actual issues. It's so far so good. It looks like a major bottom's in place in oil. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. Have done that in a while. Yeah, you could get a weekly bow tie in oil. So it's all kind of cooking in here. It's kind of interesting. Cooking oil, right? Uh, oil is on the verge of making this big, big, big longer term turn. Um, interest rates look like they're rolling over a little bit, or bonds, I should say, look like they're rolling over, over means higher rates. Uh, dollar sliding in here, commodities headed higher. So it's kind of fun to watch it all just unwind. And it's kind of doing so in slow motion. So a lot of these things are not good for stocks. FYI, NOG, never heard of it. Dog, oh, NOG, NOG. Oh, yeah, okay. I've heard of it. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. It looks like it's getting through this overhead supply in here. So maybe on a pullback. It's got a little bit more resistance here. Uh, I would dig a little deeper, no pun intended, in these uh, energies to see if there's anything else out there that might be worthwhile. Okay, uh, Hari says, uh, not sure you covered CLF already. What would you do? Uh, my official, my tweet on that, uh, on CLF, was to let it go. But as far as trading the service mechanically, we will track it mechanically because it did technically trigger. Okay. That's my official rule is that I track everything mechanically in the service to so people could follow along with, with no confusion. Okay. Even though, like I was looking at the records this morning, it's like even though like I fat fingered uh, X, uh, EXR or whatever earlier this year and put the wrong entry in and it, it instantly triggered. Um, mechanically, so I had to track that loss, even though it was it was a bad, uh, it was just a fat finger. Okay, so you can't, you can't, or I, I follow everything mechanically in the service as far as what I actually actually publish. But in reality, I would use some discretion in a case like this. I just let it go. Okay, and 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 you just have to walk away. It's okay. I mean, it happens. There'll be other ones. 
coming along. Okay. Sid, that's going to be another metal stock. It's foreign. It's metal. Um, it's had a pretty serious run from lows, percentage-wise. Uh, and now it's just kind of consolidating in here. I think I would see if it could break out to new highs decisively and look to play the first pullback on that. Okay. Okay. Some of those in the Landry list, Andre. That's why I'm not covering them all. Okay. CYNO. Did we cover that one? I think we did. No, we didn't. Oh, did we? Uh, maybe on a pullback. It's, it needs to pull back a little bit in here. So let's let's see how the pullback shapes up. If it comes all the way back to the base, obviously you would you want to take that one off of your radar. Well, look, uh, we're right at the uh, cutoff time here, so uh, better wrap things up. Any unanswered questions? You know, between David, Dave, Lander com. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys so much for showing up. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, hopefully everybody again next week. And, and again, just shoot me an email. If, if the if the question requires a lot of thought, then it'll just become fodder for next week's show. Anyway, again, everybody enjoy your weekend, and uh, we'll hope to see everybody again next week. Thank you so much. <laughs>